Hey guys, Matt Gurney, not at home today, joining you from Halifax. Jen, with me as usual from Calgary. It is the latest episode of The Line Podcast. We've got lots to talk about. A pretty desperate Hail Mary by the Liberals that is going to impress absolutely no one. We have a very cruel nickname for a now former Liberal minister. We're going to be sharing that with you in a couple of moments. We're going to talk about the good news story our prime minister was waiting for that never showed up and why we're going to probably see Justin Trudeau ordering Anthony House father to arrest the prime minister of Israel. All that and more in the latest episode of the line podcast. This episode of The Line has been brought to you by Unsmoke Canada. Canada can be a global leader in reducing the harm caused by smoking, but it requires actionable steps, including giving adult smokers the information they need to choose potentially less harmful alternatives. Learn more at unsmoke.ca. Well, Jen, I'm in a hotel room, um, and I, I want to beg the indulgence of uh, the viewers and listeners for this podcast just for a couple of points. First of all, I'm... I'm at the very end of a very long telecommunications link in order to be doing this podcast. So uh, forgive me if um, the, the, if there's any issues or disruptions. Also, I lost my voice this week. Uh, my kids brought something fun home from school. So uh, pardon me to everyone. I'm just not going to have the voice I normally do. So this might end up being a, a, a more concise podcast than normal. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it up to everyone else to decide if that's good or bad, but I don't have a lot of voice to throw around today. That's okay, Matt. I will try and do most of the talking for you. I'll, it's a That's quite the heavy burden, a heavy burden for me to carry, but I'll do my best. So let's just get into it because there actually was quite a lot of federal news this week. Oh my God. Let's start with it like and stupid news, really so ridiculous stupid. stuff that just ate people's lives. So stupid, but very fun for us because it's good fodder for a podcast. I think it's going to be extremely entertaining today. Do you remember a couple months ago when I said yeah, yeah. Sorry, Jen. Remember yeah. a couple months ago, I said right to the liberals, it's only going to get worse. Like I, I tried to speak oh. right through this microphone and say to them, "You're, it's going to get humiliating." Like, think about that. Is it worth it? Well, here we are. Yes. No. It's it, and, and it, we are spiraling into stupidity territory. Let's start with the GST. So this week, Trudeau announced that there will be like this temporary vacation on GST starting. December 15th, sorry, 14th, I believe, just in time for your holiday Christmas shopping, if you haven't already done it, which I haven't. So thank you, I guess. Um, I think that the general consensus on this one is that this is really, really stupid. This is just another attempt at putting a check in the mail for Canadians in order to give them good, happy feelings uh, toward the Trudeau government ahead of what's next, well, the next, presumably the next election. Um, I think that actually we may be able to interpret this as a sign of the election coming in spring, though, right? Like, why send a why send a bunch of rebate checks out in the mail in late December, early January if you're not expecting an election to come? Come, but usually that that tends to be this government's mo. You'll notice, before, you'll remember prior to the last election, there was the five hundred dollar check stall the olds that went just before they dropped the writ. So usually, when these guys literally start mailing Canadians money, that's a sign that an election is imminent. I would just point that out. Um, it could also be to the try other and interesting get thing is I don't think like, the conservatives have jammed up the house, right? And one of the things I've seen is that yes. they want the NDP to agree to stop that so that they can pass this. I don't like the NDP might agree to do it on a very limited basis, like we'll do this, but nothing else. But yeah, it's some combination of buttering up the electorate before an election and needing to get the NDP back in the tent. Well, the other thing I would say is I think we should talk about the jamming up of the of, of parliament because we haven't actually talked about it on the podcast before. It's an interesting situation. Um, it, it just veers a little too heavily into the the procedural wonky side for us to necessarily devote a huge amount of time to. But this is a good opportunity because for the last several weeks, the conservatives have been running a filibuster to try and get access to what's called the Green Slush Fund documents. Um, the liberals were ordered by parliament to produce documents um demonstrating, or how should I say this, uh, showing where significant amounts of um, money for green investment went with the presumption that a lot of that money essentially went to their buddies. 
Uh, so it's a whole big, again, octopus, octopus economy, conflict of interest issue. We'll be getting into more of that a little bit later. I mean, you and I have talked about the, I don't know, is corruption too strong a word here? The the inherent corruption of the Canadian political system and where it's gone in the last few years. Uh, we've talked about that before. But anyway, this Green Slush Fund, they were ordered to to supply documents to Parliament on it. They refused in contempt of Parliament, which is actually a very big deal. And the Conservatives have responded to this by essentially um, uh, treating the matter like a point of privilege, which has given them the ability to filibuster the House. This has uh, prevented the Liberals from being able to pass any kind of legislation. Um, it's also prevented any future confidence motions. So the, the, the near-weekly confidence motion drama that we have um uh, experienced of late has dried up. I think that that has actually served everybody. It's it's uh, it's been a bit of a reprieve for the Liberals. It's been a bit of a reprieve for the NDP, and I think it's potentially also um, uh, allowed the Conservatives to keep their powder dry on that particular front. Um, but it also has stalled the process of of government. Right? Like, are we are we going to get a full economic update? How long can they keep the filibuster going? Can it go? Can they you know, prevent a budget from being passed in the spring. Like it's, it's a really interesting set of procedural questions that re will require someone who is more of a procedural wonk than I am to fully parse. So Matt, I mean, I think it's safe to say this is all politically motivated. It's not going to result in any significant savings for Canadians. People are going to roll their eyes at it. I don't think it's going to change the liberal fortunes. I do think it does signal to the electorate that they're getting it that people are pinched, that they're concerned about everyday pocketbook issues. I do think it does give the right signal, but there's also no dispute in my mind that this is just terrible policy. Just from a pure walk perspective, perspective, it's dreadful, dreadful policy. policy. I agree it's terrible. I, everything you've said, the, the only thing I'm going to add to anything that you've said over the last few minutes is before the pedants get after us, I know that the conservatives are technically not filibustering, but it's functionally a filibuster spare us. Um, to, to the more uh, substantive point, yeah, it's bad policy and all the people are jumping on it. Like, it's funny to see like a bunch of liberals in Ontario, the, the greatest province ever, um, were, were all over Doug Ford a couple weeks ago because Doug announced $200 checks going to every Ontarian early next year. And this is clearly setting up an election and Doug's pretending it's not, but like, we don't have to pretend to be stupid for his benefit. So of course it is. And a lot of people were like, what a terrible use of taxpayers money. What a bribe to voters. How insulting. And then like a couple of weeks later, Trudeau's like, well, Hey, I take your $200 checks and I raise you $250 checks. And he gussied it up a little bit because he set like an, er an earnings cap on it. So anyone over a, th a threshold won't get it. And uh, he's saying, oh, it's targeted because it's items that everyday Canadians are struggling with. You know what? Okay. So they, they, they spent 30 seconds trying to make this look less pathetic than it is. But like I just said about Doug Ford a minute ago, we don't have to pretend to be stupid for the prime minister's benefit. This is stupid. This is dumb policy. And it's such stupid policy that I don't think it will really be good politics. It's and it's it's going to end up causing problems, right? Like because there are going to be Canadians who are going to not hear about this because they don't read the news, and then they're going to go out and make a big purchase because they're getting their Christmas shopping done early, and they're going to do it two days before the cutoff, and they're only going to find out weeks later at Christmas dinner when someone mentions, "Hey, girl, great gift for the kids. Did how much did you save on the GST?" And they're going to go, "What? What do you mean?" And then they're going to find out, "What the fuck? I didn't know. I I spent like a hundred bucks more than I had to." It's going to piss people off. You've also got a weird assortment of people criticizing the government, including people who I would say are normally sympathetic to the government, but also like, oh, for, oh one more thing before I get to the, the big point, retailers, what are, uh, what are they supposed to do? Like, this is going to be like a paperwork problem for them. Like, they're going to have to figure out exactly which items change price at the stroke of yeah. midnight, like 11 days before Christmas. Like, awesome. This is dumb. That this yes. uh, like this is going to piss people off on the retail side and the consumer side. Are some people going to notice and be like, "Oh, wow, cool, I got a check"? Yeah, probably. Are some people going to notice uh, uh, things are a little bit cheaper at the store? Yeah, probably. Enough to move votes? No, I, I, I don't think so. But the bigger picture that I was going to make is that the liberals never figured out how to make political hay out of the rebates for the carbon tax, and you've written 
a, a great column about this, where like you've the rebates are the problem, right? The liberals designed a tax system that was overtly taking money from people with lots of money and just handing it to people with less money. And they never figured out how to make that work for them politically. But they're going to figure out the Christmas thing in three weeks? Like, I'm sorry. They're, they just don't have the political chops to do this anymore. And I think we're also getting, like, th this is where I loop back to what I was saying a minute ago, Jen. The idea of, <clears throat> excuse me, this is only going to get more painful and more humiliating for the liberals. To all of my liberal friends who are listening right now, elected MPs, staffers, associated people in the broader Liberal Party of Canada orbit, welcome to your game show host era, which is one of the final stops any dying government hits before you get fucking wiped out. Congratulations. You get a car and you get a car or, or price of, like, I don't watch a lot of game shows or talk daytime talk. I can't really do the cliches here. You get an EV, EV you get a face mask, you get a, you know. Justin it's, Trudeau. It just, it's very desperate. It's, it smells very desperate. If there's, and like, I was looking at the video of the announcement yesterday, Trudeau and Freeland in a, in a kitchen with a bunch of like food items lined up behind him, including loaves of bread and Lay's potato chips, Canadian, of course. And that old Dutch, though, I'll note. This is the guy who came into power, a voice for a new generation and progressive liberalism. He was going to, you know, a darling of the international elites for years. And he's reduced to handing out checks before Christmas and offering discounts on beer and coolers and wine. Okay, guys, like so governments that live too long eventually become their parodies of themselves. And here they are. Welcome to your game show years, Trudeau. I mean, the other thing I would point out is as the game show wears on, the prizes get smaller. Right. I mean, you, you no longer have the fiscal capacity to give people something meaningful or useful. So you're throwing out pennies. Right. You, you, we're, we're, we're at the, we're not even at, we're not even at like the Oprah give a big famous, the annual giveaway level of the, of the game show anymore. Now we're doing like prices right from the Dollar Tree. That's, that's where we're at. Da, da, da. Um, and also just for, for added, for added fun, because we're going to talk about this a bit more in a minute, because I'll, I'll, I'll explain later on in the podcast why I'm in Halifax, because that's going to be relevant. But just on this front, can you imagine? Because look, there's plenty of Americans in in D.C. who can read our news or have friends, family in Canada. The, I, I hate the term, right? But the people-to-people -people ties between Canada and the United States are really deep. And there's going to be tons of people in the Congress we're going to be like, hey, Canada, like, where's your defense spending? Hey, Canada, where's your defense spending? And we're going to be going, well, hey, come on, guys. Like, we have to be doing this in a prudent way. Right at the time, we're whacking our one of our most efficient consumption taxes down and handing out checks. So we're going to go to Congress. We we have, Mel we're, again, we'll talk about this later, but like, we have Melanie Jolie down doing a tour of D.C. And she's going to be explaining, oh, you know, we're going to do our best, but we have to be prudent. We have to make targeted investments. It's going to take time. But do we have time to hand out $250 checks to working Canadians under $150,000 of income starting next month? Apparently we do. We. Anyway, um, I don't think there's anything more to say about this, to be honest with you. It's just, it is what it is. Do you want to talk about Trump bump or do you want to save that for the next segment? Yeah, no, let's, let's come back in a minute. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But okay. um, we're gonna, as if we're this gonna, isn't we're... bad enough news for the guys in Ottawa, we've got worse. Yes, there's a, some very interesting polling come out. But first, like and subscribe to The Line. Do check us out, www.readtheline.ca. This episode of The Line has been brought to you by Unsmoke Canada, which is dedicated to helping Canadians who are looking to quit smoking understand the full range of options available. Despite decades of government programs and regulations, today, nearly 5 million Canadian adults smoke cigarettes. Adult smokers who choose to continue to smoke should be aware that other options exist. Right now, accessing information about these options is heavily restricted in Canada. 
While not risk-free, alternatives such as heated tobacco and vaping products provide a potentially less harmful choice than cigarettes. Cigarettes burn tobacco, resulting in smoke that contains 6,000 harmful chemicals that are associated with smoking-related disease and death. Heating tobacco and vaping products have the potential to significantly reduce this risk. Health agencies around the world are now considering these alternatives to help end smoking. Updated laws can help adult smokers better understand the full range of options available, including the relative risk of these products. Millions of Canadians smoke cigarettes. Technology exists that can help change that, but policymakers need to take action. Learn about how a smoke-free future can be achieved at unsmoke.ca. You know what I love? What do you love? Things that rhyme. Oh, well, that's just because you're a reader. Trump bump. Trump bump. Trump bump. Trump bump. You know, you know, you know. In another life, I would have been the person who put together the Toronto Suns A ones. Yeah, I know. Yeah, if you're if if you're a journalist, you get it, you feel it. Yeah. Um, Abacus new poll out this week, and uh, there have been a few federal polls over the last few weeks showing there actually has been a little bit of tightening. Um, the the twenty plus conservative lead is tightened more up to be about fifteen. Oh. But Abacus just came out with a new one that is all kinds of interesting. Um, top line numbers, Abacus is still showing the Conservatives with a 21-point lead. The NDP and the Liberals are now tied. And that's been something I've been watching for a while because this is all within the margins of error. Like This is not a huge movement, but the NDP is now within striking distance of the Liberals. They won't win as many seats. They don't have the seat efficiency to do it, but they're getting to be more popular than the Liberals. The Liberals are trending down to third place. But the big one, and this is why we started talking about Trump bum, is this uh, Abacus had the first full role of polling that we've seen so far in Canada that only included data that was after the U.S. election results became known. And we know from a lot of reporting and just some conversations you and I have had directly that the Liberals kind of last remaining hope other than $250 checks was that Canadians would recoil from a reelected Donald Trump and seek safe harbor under the Liberals. Hasn't happened. There's just no evidence of any kind of Trump reaction in the Canadian polling numbers whatsoever. In fact, it's very interesting because I, I was expecting that there would be a bit of a Trump counter reaction in Canada, and I've been surprised by how little there's been. And I think it's a reflection of the degree to which Trump has been normalized over the last decade, both in America and here in Canada. He's just another fact of life now. The other thing that I think is... I agree entirely. That, I've, I've noticed the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not... The, the novelty, the shock value is kind of worn off on him. Rightly or wrongly, it is what it is. Um, the other thing that I think his actual re-election has done is made people realize, oh, shit, we might be in some trouble. We need to start taking this seriously. We need to start considering the possibility that the world is shifting around us, and we need to start adapting appropriately. These are sort of observations that you and I have been making publicly for years now, but what nothing really... Years? couple years now yeah. um but nothing's really i think drummed at home for some people who are paying attention further than the idea that the america not only not only elected trump but emphatically elected trump he won emphatically that's My not a have failed to sway the course of canadian public opinion jen that's for some it's a big mystery but anyway um uh, this is forcing people to sort of start taking our bilateral relationships more seriously it's forcing us to be taking questions of trade and geopolitical security way more seriously and that's a real problem for a country that's not run by serious people so yeah, i think it's worth notice noting that the, the trump bump ain't coming and in fact i think the trump bump is or the trump phenomenon is going to force canadians to get very real about the world they're actually living in um one of the things that I have noticed since Trump was elected, and I think this is the U.S., and I think it's reflected in Canada, is that there is going to be a civic pivot. The civic pivot. A lot of words. It's great. Um, there's a civic pivot happening where, you know. Trump bump the, civic pivot. The Trump bump civic pivot. Uh, where at the height of 2020, there was kind of a purging of the wrong thinkers out of what I would call the broadly smushy left institutional institutions. 
that's coming back. Like, I don't think that a lot of most of our institutions are going to go full MAGA or anything like that. But I do sense that there's a sense of, oh, we've lost touch with where most people are and we probably need to recalibrate. We need to be resetting our baselines a little bit from where we were in 2020 or 2021. Um, so you're seeing that in, in, for example, the hiring of people like Jonathan Chait at The Atlantic. You know, a lot of people on the left who would have been very successful at screaming Jonathan Chait out of a platform four years ago are suddenly realizing that not only do they not have the power to do that anymore, but any organization, any institution that's interested in its own survival in the long term can no longer continue to screen 80% of an electorate out of a platform. It's not, it's not an effective winning strategy for you. Again, something you and a point you and I have been making for some time now in our own interest, as well as the interest of the world around us. So there's, there's just that shift that's happening and none of that bodes well for the, for the liberals. None of that bodes well for, you know, a party that's pegged itself to an increasingly niche version of progressive politics. I mean, this is again, a point that you, that we made after Trump was elected. Yeah. It's true that Kamala Harris didn't run on woke. She didn't. She, she, they, the, the entire slate of Democrats ran on actually pretty centrist campaigns. Great. You can't separate the hundred days of the campaign from the 10 years of politics that preceded it. You can't do that. And, you know, I, it's really great that Trudeau et al. are starting to come to terms with the, the problems with their immigration policy and the problems with their approach to checkbook, pocketbook issues. That's great. But you can't do that four months before an election or five months before an election and expect that people are going to be able to divorce your new, this new revamped version of you from the 10 years that came before. It's why the checks won't work either. That's right. You know, you, no, you, no one is going to get their check in the mail and go onto the porch and take the fuck Trudeau flag down. Yeah. You no, know, I, I think the Trump bump to me was fascinating, right? Because it's one of those things where like once I knew what they were counting, they meaning senior liberals, once I knew they were thinking about it, I was like, yeah, okay. Like I can see the thought process that leads them there. The problem is what I don't know if they can see all of the reasons why that's a stupid thought process. Like, okay, yes, I could see a leading to B, but they haven't thought about C, D, E and on. A Trump bump, in theory, let's say Canadians go, oh, dear, like Donald Trump's been reelected. How, how awful. What are we going to do now? You then need to have the ability for the liberals to actually absorb any benefit of that. And to do that, they have to be a reasonably competent party. They're not. And we're going to talk in our next segment about a little bit of news that came out of the Liberal cabinet this week, and we're going to laugh at them. And we're going to laugh about how they responded to this. But just the notion, the notion that these guys are in any position to even be the beneficiaries of good luck, I think is delusional. And every problem Justin Trudeau had, every single one of them, a month ago, he still has. And now he's got a whole lot more. And all the new ones he has since November the 5th are really big ones and they're really complicated ones. And they're going to put huge demands on his government, sort of political and intellectual and frankly, probably even emotional resources. Justin Trudeau was, was like almost dead prime minister walking like a couple of months ago, like cannons to the left of him, cannons to the right of him, all volleying and thundering. And... And now he has Donald Trump. Now he has an entire global order that is going to be realigning himself. Now he has Mexico going, hello, Mr. Trudeau. Why is the premier of your largest province talking about throwing us under the bus? Now he has Europe going, oh boy, we'd better get serious about some defense. And Canada ain't along for that ride. Nothing in Justin Trudeau's life is easier today than a month ago. And he was struggling a month ago. Trump bump. That's delusional. That's a Trump bump is what the liberals convinced themselves to believe in because they ain't got nothing else left. 
Can I also just note that something that also was interesting this week was uh, the number of people from interesting corners of the political sphere calling on Jester Trudeau to um, call an election now before the inauguration because he does not have and he's his, his government just doesn't have the mandate to deal with the new reality that we're going to be facing for a minimum of four years and that he would be better off and the country would be, would be better off to call the election dissolve it now and get a new government in place in time to deal with the Americans rather than try and drag out some kind of weird um, uh, situ a weird relationship in which the Trump people hate Trudeau and they know he's a lame duck leader anyway in order you're losing you you want to go hard on tr on Mexico for example in a renegotiation of of NAFTA well you can't do that under a lame duck leader because everybody knows that anyone they're negotiating with today is going to be gone in 6 months to 12 months anyway so you have no leverage going into these negotiations you have no capacity to be ruthless with no mandate so you you're putting yourself and the entire country at a disadvantage by not calling an election as soon as humanly possible and reestablishing a new mandate with a new government, your government or whatever, uh, post the, I think it was January 26th inauguration of Trump. I think that's right. I mean, and again, it's been interesting to hear the calls coming from inside the house on that one. I think it was- uh, It's not a ton, but there's a few. There's been a few who have said this publicly and they're correct. It's, yeah, it's we're, we're reaching the point where just dragging this out is not only bad for, the liberals domestically, but their continuation and insistence that an, an, on clinging to power, despite the fact that they can't get anything passed and they can't get anything done in the face of a Trump inauguration, risks damaging the country on a generational time scale. Because while we're fucking around, Trudeau's, or sorry, the Mexicans are going to be throwing us under the bus. Like this is and this the Europeans is what, and the Australians and the Europeans, and Japanese. everyone's gonna because they can and also because you have no leverage, they know you're gone anyway. Like you, you're you are actually setting the country up to fail in this scenario in a very significant way. Um, of course, they won't listen to that and they don't care because they put their own interests above anybody else's, and that's just how they operate. I think, Jen, what they do is they confuse their interests and the national interest. And they always have. What are Canadian values? Liberal values. What do liberals believe in? Canadian values. Exactly. Right. They conflate their own political interests with the national interests. They cannot. They are fundamentally incapable of separating the two things. Um, on that note, do we want to take a pause and break and move on to the latest drama from the Liberal Caucus? Or do you just want to roll right into this, the tale of Mr. Randy Bosineau? Uh, you know what? I love saying like and subscribe. So we'll, we'll take a we'll take like a five second break here. We'll come back and we'll actually talk about Bosino, and we'll, but actually you're, you're not wrong, Jen. This is highly related. So we're going to be back in just a second. Check us out at readtheline.ca. We love you very much. I need to go have a cough drop, which is actually my real secret motive for taking a break here. Like and subscribe. We'll be right back. Okay, so. Matt, I have to admit that I, like everyone else, have been watching the soap opera that is the Randy, will will they or won't they kick Randy Bosino out of cabinet? I have to be honest with you, I find this story so convoluted and hysterically funny that I'm going to struggle to explain it. So you're going to have to help me. Okay? Well, I, I was graciously allowing you to do that because I also find it convoluted. But okay, it's let's, super let's convoluted. see what we can do. I guarantee you I'm going to make some kind of error at some point of my trying to explain the story because it's like trying to explain, you know, um, passions circa 2003 and like what happened to the crazy possessed doll named Timmy. You know what I mean? Don't ask me how I know that. Was that the young adult soap opera? It, w it was for adults. Let's not kid ourselves. Okay, so Randy Bosino one of the few uh, liberal MPs from Alberta, gay, with some, some family claim of some variety to indigenous heritage. We'll get into that. That has shifted. Tick, tick. Tick, tick, tick. It's not hard to see how this man made his way into cabinet. Let's just put it that way. It's not hard for us to understand why he was chosen to be uh, the Liberals' representative in Alberta. 
there he's like the perfect fantasy of what um an albertan is to a liberal gay indigenous westerner there you go unfortunately you know anybody who's been paying attention in alberta politics for a while has heard some things about randy over the years you know as you do and this particular drama kind of comes to a head in 2020 when apparently randy either starts or takes ownership of a company that was designed to try and pitch the federal government to provide, um, I think, uh, COVID-related medical supplies um, and provide those to various health services. But of course, because Randy was in cabinet at the time, he couldn't actually be directly involved in the company and he had to recuse himself from any kind of involvement in this company. Because of course, a cabinet member can apparently own a company that's pitching to the government. They just can't be involved with getting the government to give that company money, nor can they invo be involved with any of the running of that company. At the same time, this company apparently claimed to have been quote unquote, indigenously owned a moniker which would allow them to get access kind of uh, fast track contracts and services within certain aspects of the federal government. We know the federal government has a, has a priority, for example, of um, uh, giving special notice or giving special priority to indigenous owned companies in order to help disadvantaged people from disadvantaged places get a leg up, get forward. So this all kind of comes to head when, when, I, I don't, how should I describe, how do I describe this? Okay, so the scandal starts when it starts to be revealed that the allegations were that, that Randy had not actually um, fully exempted himself from the running of this company and from this, these services the company was providing. And the evidence that was provided to Parliament was a series of text messages in which a Randy was referenced by other members of the company in the As context being in of, the decision-making loop for corporate decision, things, yeah. Exactly. And then Randy Bosino claimed that that wasn't him, that was another Randy who's never been identified, um, or and or that the business partner was identifying him as a person of influence without his consent. So the, the term Randy was being thrown about, thrown about very lightly. In addition to all of this, one of the revelations that came out during this whole scandal was that the medical supply company that he co-owns shared a post office box with a woman who twice had run-ins with the law over major cocaine busts. So this is all very above board, extremely legit. And Just then another this day week, at the office for a cabinet minister. I mean, who but for the grace of God could go any of us, really? Then this whole thing comes to a head again when it starts to come out that like Randy's claims to indigenous heritage are, hold the phone, you'll be shocked to know, perhaps a little suspect. Turns out that Randy Bosino's great grandmother was not an adopted full blood Cree as he had claimed. Instead, she was Metis. So his claims to indigenous heritage were in fact rooted in the fact that his great-grandmother was adopted into a Métis family. So, of course, this is all just a big misunderstanding from Brandy's point of view. He's like, I, I, I genuinely thought that my great-grandmother was adopted into a full-blown blooded Cree family. My goodness, I was just mistaken. This is a case of mistaken family identity. Oh, but by the way, I never really claimed that I was really indigenous and I only sat in the um, Liberal Party's Indigenous Caucus as an ally, not as an actual Indigenous person. And then, of course, all these sorts of claims from the past start to come out in which Randy is perhaps less than precise about his Indigenous ancestry, including I saw one where he gave a speech wearing like a necklace with the big wolf's head on it. And he called himself, oh, I can't remember what exactly what it was, was it Big Storm or something like or that? Big like that's, or something. It, yeah. 
there's a lot to unpack here. But the point I think is what what was this man doing? For, first, okay, let's get the, the indigenous claim stuff is interesting and worth unpacking in and of itself. My first point is, what in the holy fuck was a cabinet minister doing owning a company that was trying to do business with the federal government in the first place? Indigenous owned or not. That's obviously red flag alert, and that should have gotten him boot booted from caucus right then and there. It is not appropriate for a cabinet minister to have anything to do with a company that's trying to do business with the federal government. Period. That's fine. <laughs> no, that's good. not fine. That's clearly not fine. All good. Even if you redact, even if you recuse yourself from explicit decision making conversations, the fact that y you have your 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 foot rooted in a, a business at the time when you're making a very generous salary as a cabinet minister and are being amply compensated for that is inappropriate because it means that you know even if you're not necessarily making the decisions that lead to the contract specifically, you're, d that company is getting privileged access to inside sources. They're getting networked. They're getting a hey, fellow um, minister. I've recused myself. Wink, wink. It's also like, hey, this is. These guys have the inside scoop on how to navigate government contracts and government systems. And it goes back to what we've been talking about for repeatedly over a long time, increasingly the degree to which Canada's entire economy is an octopus economy. The people who get ahead in this country are the people who are best at learning how to navigate the federal government. That skews incentives away toward away from innovation and productivity, and it skews incentives toward insider dealing and rent seeking. That's the system we've created for ourselves. I mean, even in media, they've created this system for themselves. I mean, you and I have taken great pride about it being basically one of three media outlets that don't take federal government money. That's because we want to make money by providing a service of value to our readers, not by showing how well we can navigate internal government bureaucracies. Discovering you have like a Metini great grandmother should not be a federal jackpot. Yes. So Correct. And then the laugh gets me to the other conversation around indigenous heritage. Okay. All of us white mutts in this goddamn country have a mixture of heritage from all over the goddamn show, and not all of us have a perfect understanding of all of it. And if you start um, uh, peeling back the onions on that, you're going to find some interesting heritage in the background. Okay. Granted, I do not identify with whatever ethnicity one of my great grandparents was because that's freaking insane. That's insane. You know, family lore has always said that one of my grandparents thought they had some Canadian indigenous blood from like five generations ago. And it wasn't until COVID when my dad, you know, like the rest of us was like locked up and couldn't go anywhere. And he kind of did the family genealogy and we didn't find any. And you never know, maybe there's something there, or maybe a church record is wrong, or as you said, maybe someone gets adopted. Like, you never know, but it, it looks like I am exactly what I have always thought I was and acted like, which is the th most fucking white hoser, canock hockey head like you could ever imagine. I am what I am. You know? No, wait, wait no, here, no, I would say this. I would say this. Okay, so ethnicity, sorry, identity is not solely rooted in ethnicity or genetics. And, you know, if Randy Bosano had been raised in a Cree family or had like some kind of like um, uh, aspect of indigenous culture woven into his, his, his childhood upbringing or something like that. Okay. You know, like, okay, fair enough. It's not for me to say that you're this or that. It's not me for me to say that you are not indigenous or indigenous. It's for up to indigenous people to claim their own. I, I respect that. But if this guy actually had been raised in a strong indigenous cultural background my guess is he would have known that he wasn't right that he wasn't you know uh, from an adopted full-blood cree family he would have known from a pretty early a stage that he was in fact from an adopted metis family the fact that he only discovered that as part of his evolving understanding of his genealogy tells me that he was probably raised as goddamn white as you and me oh <laughs> right that Randy Bosano is like in the running with me for like own the podium whiteness. You know, it is what it is. I, no, I, I don't, I'm actually with, 
I'm with you on that, Jen, because I grew like I'm like again, like I'm as friggin' waspy as they come. And I actually by I grew up sort of on the border between a pretty waspy suburban area and a pretty Jewish area. And just because of school boundaries and hockey teams, I wound up with a lot of Jewish friends. And you know, when I was in my twenties, my Jewish friends threw me on a chair, lifted me in the air a bunch of times, declared me an honorary member of the tribe. And um, it was just a, it was just a big laugh. We we joke about it to this day. I wouldn't go out and try to get federal contracts from Israel. You're not you're not you're not making a Leah. It's basically yeah, what you're saying exactly. here. Right. You're not you're, you're not, not like, claiming birthright. You yeah. didn't get the free trip to Israel. That's what you're you telling know, me here. I have I have a cultural affinity for and an affection for Jews. I'm not one. And believe me, a, a series of mothers of Jewish girls in high school very quick to point out to me I was close, but not quite Jewish. And well, more to the point, I think they point out to their daughters. Um, thinking of all of this and listening to you recap it all, I'm with you. There's nuances in understanding identity and, and heritage and emerging genealogical understanding of family trees. New records are discovered. Secrets are revealed. Um, I, I had oh, this process like three weeks ago, so I can have I some empathy yeah. for this. Yep, and I've I've heard some some doozy stories as well. Like we're in the era of people spitting onto a Q-tip, mailing it away, and then discovering that they have secret half-siblings they never knew about. Like, Daddy's we not live in Daddy. interesting times. Yeah. Um, but just listening to this on the political level, and this is where we all are kind of tying everything we've talked about so far. We talked about the GST shenanigans, the prime minister arriving in his game show host era, which is the last stop before humiliating oblivion. We've got the, uh, what we're talking about a minute ago, no Trump bump. What I found genuinely fascinating about uh, the Bosino stuff was that, and this is a point I've made about these guys many, many, many times before, and I'm going to make it explicitly again. There was something about Justin Trudeau and his PMO where they are shockingly slow to detect and respond to political danger. And I remember like in during, especially during the convoy, when I was writing about this, I'm like, I'm looking around the city of Ottawa knew they were in deep shit. The province of Ontario knew they were in deep shit. The RCMP, as far as I could tell, knew they were in deep shit. The PMO was 10 to 14 days behind understanding the facts on the grounds. And when, when the public order emergency commission eventually came out with the documents, this becomes clear. They were way behind understanding reality. And that was a maximum emergency by their standards. Bosino is just not quite that bad, which means they were even slower. And like, let's just walk through this. I'm not going to restate the entire timeline the way Jen did, because I think she did a good job of it. But let's just, we're going we're gonna to play the hits here, Jen. You've got a federal okay. minister potentially receiving financial compensation or benefits from business dealings that are inappropriate given his role. We've got... Um, criminal, the, the, the cocaine element being linked again to a minister of the crown, not making any direct accusation against uh, Mr. Bosno. I want that to be clear, yes. but there's, there's some smoke the, the, the there. That, the, the connection is tenuous. It's a little tenuous, but it's more than you want with the cabinet minister. Remember Maxime Bernier's girlfriend? Wait, mm -hmm. like we're going back in time here a bit. That's the kind of thing you got to be careful about. Sure. Then we've got the. You, don't, you just um, don't want to be sharing PO boxes with with people who are involved in massive cocaine busts. Then Reasonable you've got. Diligence. Then you've got just I would say the obvious stupidity around. Well, it's some other Randy, or we can't explain who this is. Or yes, I again, a minister of the crown, am such a dupe that I didn't know my business partner was banking on my name and federal position. That's a problem. And then, of course, we come to the so-called pretendian stuff. All four of these things, any one of them, under normal government, would probably be enough for like a prime minister to go, hey, you know, Randy, you got you to gotta, you gotta sit this one out for a while. We're going to call someone in and, and have an investigation. We're going to look into this. And we're going to do it in a way that is not an admission of, of wrongdoing. It's going to be like, look, there have been serious allegations that have been made. It's appropriate that I step aside and allow a third party investigation to occur. Any one of these arguably warranted it. 
Any two of them combined, absolutely warranted. Three of them combined, oh my God. Four of them combined, what the fuck? And it still took weeks to get to where we got to this week, which is that Bosono is temporarily out of cabinet. And it's just fascinating to me, yet again, example 5,000 for the Justin Trudeau liberals, that I and you and just about anyone else who is paying attention in this country saw where this was going to end months ago. The PMO apparently figured it out a few days ago. And these are the guys who are quarterbacking our efforts to respond to global upheaval and complete geopolitical realignment. We'll be we'll we'll be getting to that in just a minute in our next segment. First, I would like to say, and I'd say, despite the amusement that we all have about Randy Bosino's um, uh, adventures through ethics, I am going to say that I am very disappointed. I'm very disappointed, Matt, because a nickname for Mr. Bosino has begun making the rounds. It's outrageous. It's, it's outrageous and it's offensive. And I would like to know everyone should know. That anyone who's called Randy Bosino Cocahontas should feel bad about themselves because the allegations and connections to cocaine are highly tenuous. And also that's very offensive to First Nations people. It does not take these issues as seriously as they are warranted. You know what? You know, I, I join Jen in her outrage at anyone who would dare use the nickname Cocahontas to refer to either Mr. Bosino uh, or any element of this scandal. I believe in my voice and for those who are watching on YouTube, my facial cast <laughs> is signaling my enormous anger and you disappointment. Should feel, and you anyone should feel who embarrassed would, and ashamed of yourselves. You should. Yeah. Have you no decency, sir? You know, it was also outrageous this week in, in the House of Commons. And this was just fantastic. No, I'm sorry. Pardon me. I, I overphrase that. This was awful. This was very upsetting. Um, oh, my goodness. You're literally weeping. <laughs> you can see how upset Jen is. Uh, this has really gotten to her. Uh, she's broken Dreamly down upsetting. in tears. Um, Michael Barrett, conservative MP uh, in the House this week uh, about this issue, had... Uh, referred to the former minister, I, again, outrageously. Well, pardon me, I should rephrase that. He made a reference in the House to cocaine Randy, and a liberal member opposite objected, and Michael Barrett uh, took to his feet and, and immediately clarified he was talking about the other Randy. And it was a quick quip. It was good. Like, I admired the being quick on his feet. But seeing the liberal bench, the look on their eyes in that moment when they realized they'd been bested, because when your entire line of defense is that there's another Randy out there, how can you claim that a comment about Randy is about your Randy? That it was textbook hoist on your own petard. But anyway, these guys, I'm sure, are totally up to navigating everything going on right now. And on yeah, that note, like, we'll get we'll get back to that right after you like and subscribe. Line. Jen composes herself. <laughs> well, Jen and I have pulled ourselves together. Uh, we professionals. It was We're very, very serious emotional. Professionals. Yeah, it was a very emotional third segment for us both. Um, serious people, serious people covering a serious country. No, and I'm so serious right now, and I just I apologize to the viewers and listeners for this. I'd mentioned to you at the beginning that my voice is a bit weak. Um, I am. Uh, I, I literally have a lozenge in my mouth right now. So apologies if you hear me crunching on this, guys. But I, I am fading. So we'll, we'll try to wrap this up before I lose my voice entirely. So Jen, should I tell people where I am? Yeah, absolutely. Tell them where. Tell tell people where you are, and then we're going to talk about Melanie Jolie and the International Court. I'm in Halifax, Nova Scotia, one of my favorite cities in this country. Uh, shout out to all my friends in Atlantic Canada. And I, I'm, I'm not just saying this to butter up the local crowd. I love Halifax. I like it more when it's not four degrees and like blowing rain. That's not great, especially for a guy who's just gotten over a, a chest cold. But no, it's great to be here. Um, I'm here for the internet, uh, the Halifax uh, Security Forum. It's, uh, it's an annual conference that brings together military and security leadership from across the Western Alliance, uh, heavy on NATO. 
but other allies as well. Um, th there's often uh, Taiwanese delegations uh, last year. I don't, I'm not sure yet about this year. I haven't actually made it down to the venue yet. There was an Israeli presence last year, shortly after the October 7th attacks. I expect there to be a heavy Ukrainian presence, uh, as there has been in, in recent years. And it's an opportunity to see old friends, old colleagues, but also to talk on and off the record with a variety of thinkers on military defense and related uh, issues. And this is a, a conference I really enjoy, and I'm, I'm very grateful for the organizers for inviting me yet again this year. So many thanks to them. Um, the reason I just bring all this up is because I flew, I, I, had, a, I had a wonderful air travel experience getting here. Could not have gone better. Wow. Did you fly Air Chaos? Uh, yeah. So I am, I'm cruising on too few hours of sleep and uh, a, a boatload of stress. Well, plane load of stress, I guess, getting here because things didn't go well. But anyway, here I am. Um, woke up this morning again after a brief little snooze to the fact that from Washington, as happens every year, a large congressional delegation, a bipartisan Democrats and Republicans have arrived. And one of them this morning opened up with just a blistering salvo. So it, just to, to beg the indulgence of uh, the viewers and listeners, again, I've actually pulled this up. These are uh, quotes this morning from the uh, opening of the, of the convention. I wasn't here for this because my, my air travel problems, but I, yeah. so I missed this. But uh, Mike Turner, uh, U.S. House Representative Republican from Ohio, is one of the uh, congressmen who has traveled to Halifax for this, and he has ripped into Trudeau. Here are some uh, quotes from from uh, Mr. Turner. Um, the Trudeau policies are the freeloading policies of a NATO of decay. If everyone had the policies of Trudeau, there would be no NATO. The Trudeau leadership has been of incredible arrogance that it is believed it is above the need to understand that the threats to democracy is authoritarianism, and the only preservation we could have for democracy is having a strong defense. Trudeau's policies have outsourced it. They have freeloaded on the backs of the American taxpayer. And there's more. He goes on at some length. He's a Republican, but having come to this conference for a few years now, I can tell you with 100% confidence and firsthand knowledge, Jen, Democrats don't sound that different. He's right. He's completely right. He He's is right. 100% right. Also, I believe, again, this is a kind of through line in this podcast, Matt and Jen told you so. We told you this was coming. This is, Jen, what I've been writing about more than anything else in my career. I started at the National Post during the war in Afghanistan. Like, this is... Canada needing to pull its weight in the alliance, both for actual matters of security, but also for credibility within the alliance. I have probably written more about that than literally anything else in my entire career. Right. So, duh. Um, oops. In the meantime, we have our uh, head of basically foreign affairs, Melanie Jolie, uh, heading to the United States in order to try and build some bridges with the Trump presidency, which, I mean, as I said earlier in this podcast, strikes me as utterly futile because no one's going to regard any delegate from the current liberal government seriously because everyone knows very well that it's on the way out. But okay, you're going to go down and talk to Americans. That's never a bad idea for someone in her position. Unfortunately, Melanie Jolie, and I say this with all the respect that I can reasonably muster because I don't think she's a bad person, She's just an intellectual lightweight, and everyone knows it. Um, it's not a secret. Uh, I, I, you know, Freeland, we've given Freeland some shit about the way she talks to Canadians, but Freeland actually gets it. She gets what's happening in the world order, and she has her head on straight about some of this stuff. I don't know what Jolie gets or doesn't get, but she doesn't sound like a particularly, let's just put it this way, to quote Donald Trump, we're not sending our best. Um, and it came up in Politico that she's got a bunch of meetings down in the U.S. with, I'm going to, you know, name some names, Lindsey Graham, Lisa Murkowski, and Rick Scott. 
So this is something that we, again, were talked about in the podcast a couple of weeks ago, that very frequently in recent years, when you see Canadian delegations, either federal, federal delegations or provincial delegations going down to the United States, what we consistently see now more and more is high-level delegations of premiers or people or ministers of the crown going down and meeting with nobodies. But because we don't have the contacts, the diplomatic contacts, the diplomatic talent to understand and connect with people who are actually movers and shakers in D.C. and all some of the various states as well, they don't understand that they're meeting with nobodies. So there's this kind of weird mutual industry happening where... You know, we're sending all these people down to this, to this. I'm not even just blaming the federal government here. The provinces have done this too. We're sending all these people down to the United States to build connections. We're paying them significant amounts of money. These people don't understand how can how American politics functions at a deep level. Um, they don't have they don't manage to develop the political context that they actually need to get their principles into the room with the people who matter. And then there's all these shows on Twitter about we met with. A senator, we met with a congressman, we met with the second principal of whatever. And it looks very impressive for a domestic audience, but for anybody who actually knows about American politics, what they don't realize is, is that the Canadian delegations have been given the brush off. Um, these names, Lindsey Graham, Lisa Murkowski, Rick Scott, I mean, they're going to be familiar to Canadians who read the news and read American news, but these people aren't in Trump world. They're not insiders. Some of them are toadies, but they're not insiders. They're not decision makers. They're not important. Um, and my concern here is that the Canadian diplomatic side doesn't seem to understand how not important these people are, and they think that this is good enough. They think that this is, this is a beginning, a start. I mean, I don't know if this is all the people that Julie met. Maybe she met other people that, you know, this wasn't reported on or wasn't talked about. Um, maybe this is just who would take her call. I mean, I, I'm glad to have her down. I'm, I'm glad to have her talking to Republicans because realistically, our opinion about the American election doesn't matter. We've got to work with the people that the American people chose. So I, I'm glad that we're making the efforts. I'm, I understand. I think that we've got our head in the game. We understand that we need to be ruthless and we need. I, we understand that we need to be making the inroads. The problem is that I think that some of these relationships have atrophied to such an extent that we are nowhere, we have no grasp of how far we are from the decision makers. That's that's my fear. I I mean, I get I'm not I'm not there on these these tours. So I mean I can't gauge that um perfectly from where I'm sit what I'm standing. And I could be wrong about that. So, you know, please take what I'm saying with a grain of salt here. But if this is who you're meeting. I, what worries me more, Jen, is that I'm not convinced they realize it. No, that's that, and that worries. It's one thing to say, okay, we're not in yet, but this is this is part of a, a step, or a step, or a strategy to build the networks that we need to get in. That's fine. That's perfectly legit. Okay. Or good. hey, we're there, so we'll see Senator Graham and Senator Mark Kasky, like while we're there because they've been open to Canada. There are people that we know we can work with. But like the, the, these conversations need to start a conversation about who we need to talk to next. These these conversations are not ends in of, of themselves. These conversations should be, and, and for all I know, maybe Julie understands that. Maybe she gets that. Maybe she understands she needs to be in the room and like she needs to be building these allies so that she can build the next network of allies so she can build the next network of allies. But I don't have the sense that Canada's in on Trump world. I don't think we have an in there. Um, and I don't think we've leveraged all of the options available to us to make sure that we're in on those conversations. Yeah. So, you know, third part, a third week in a row in the podcast, Jen, where I'm basically somewhat tongue in cheek, but not really saying, thank God for Wayne Gretzky. Like it's, we're going to have to leverage the weird connections. And I actually think we understood that better in Trump one. Like I think that in, in that, in that first liberal mandate when Mr. Trump was elected and, and Justin Trudeau was a relatively new prime minister with a majority government. I think there was an understanding of, okay, Donald Trump's an, an, an unorthodox guy and we're going to have to have an unorthodox strategy. We're going to charm his daughter. We're going to charge charm his son-in-law. Like we're going to, we're going to sign. So we're going to send our ambassador to hang out at Mar-a-Lago 24 seven. Yeah. We're like, we're going to send Jerry Butts on like a canoe trip with Steve Bannon. Like we were, sure. we're going to, I think that was smart and I think it worked. 
because this is something I still give the Trudeau government a lot of the actual credit for. I think they handled Trump relatively well the first time. But one of the things I think it's going to become increasingly clear with the passage of time, and uh, I'm actually, I'm just spoiling this a little bit, but readers um, are going to see me talking about this in the Toronto Star this weekend a bit. What the fuck were we doing the last four years? Like, the more, the, the further away we get from the election earlier this month in the United States, the clearer it becomes to me that we were wrong. And we put all the chips in on Trump one being a fluke and Biden being the return to normal. And we basically went like, phew, we did a great job navigating that fluky, weird, never to be repeated Trump thing. And I have heard from some sources in Ottawa that Mr. Trudeau and his closest advisors were aware of the high likelihood of Mr. Trump being elected again. This is, they were, they didn't wake up the morning after shocked. Okay. But I'm going to take a 30,000 foot top down view here. And I'm also going to try, and this is hard, but I'm going to try and put myself into the perspective of someone in the future, looking back a view of history. And this is what I was, I'm going to, I've already filed it. So it'll appear in the star later this weekend. Can anyone looking at Canada today, right now, sincerely say, man, those Canadians did a great job using that four-year Biden term to get their country ready for what was coming next? Not only did we not do critical things, I think we've moved backward on some of them. And as we were talking about at length in that last segment, it took months to realize they had to give Bosino the boot. So that brain trust are the ones having to now figure out what kind of strategic defense posture Canada is going to need for the next 20 years in order to maintain its access to the American market. And trying to negotiate that from a position of being a lame duck. On that note, let's talk about Melanie Jolie and the ICC. Let's, but let me actually just mention one thing to you. Okay. You made a comment earlier about her being an intellectual lightweight, and I'm. you can say things I can't for reasons that I think are clear. I don't know if Melanie Jolie is an intellectual lightweight, and I have in fact heard she is one of the smarter ministers in the Trudeau government. But I have also heard, and this is friendly criticism of her from people who like her, that she has been sort of media programmed into. Which, which happens to smart people. Yeah. Yeah. So Melanie Jolie might be way more impressive in private behind closed doors than the public. Absolutely. Sees. But to your point, and I agree with it. I don't have fantastic U.S. sources. I'm going to be getting them back. I used to have better ones, and I've recently decided I'd better go get some better ones. But my analysis is exactly the same as yours. The people she's meeting with might be necessary precursors to an inside angle on Mr. Trump, but she ain't there yet. So, take yeah, sorry, your point on Israel, go for it. Sorry, I got you. I just wanted to finish that thought. And I don't necessarily want to, to be too hard on Melanie Julie for exactly the reason that you're saying. I can say pretty confidently that she is not perceived to be a stunning, shining star on the international diplomatic circuit. I, I just don't think that's the case. But is that because she's not as bright as she needs to be in that job? Or is that because she has been stuck in a partisan bum bunker and essentially retrained like so many intelligent people often are in that kind of partisan environment? I, I, I don't know. I think it's very possible that that's the case. It's very possible that she's actually very, very, very bright. But she's been, you know, trapped to the to a very partisan worldview for a very long time, and she's been media trained into a position of 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 weakness. Um, this is a long standing issue, not only with the liberal government, but also with the preceding government beyond it. Well, the the liberal, or sorry, the partisan bunker is real, and it tends to erode IQ. People who are actually very bright come across as twenty to thirty IQ points below where they're actually hitting. 
when they have to start when they have to stick to government talking points because the government talking points aren't that good. Christopher Freeland. Well, exactly, right? I mean, we know that Christy Freeland's actually very smart. We know that she actually gets it. Put her in front of a microphone and it's a disaster. Um, is what it is. We all got our talents, right? We all got our weaknesses. It's fine. Well, speak for yourself. Some of us have no talent. <laughs> well, I used, to, I used to be able to sing. Um, okay, so the International Criminal Court uh, has a real yen for, for what's going on in Israel and Gaza. We're going to get into that in a little bit. But this this week, they issue um, warrants for the arrest of Benjamin Netanyahu, his former defense minister, Yoav Gallant, who was recently canned, shit canned, um, and some random Hamas, the, one of the last li living leaders left in Hamas. Um, the response for this has been very, very typical. Uh, first, I would say is, 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 I think that you and I could have a reasonable conversation about areas in which uh, Israel's actions met the standard of a, of a war crime based on the information that we know. Um, I don't necessarily think that it's wrong for the ICC to be prosecuting those war crimes, but Matt, you're much more on the ground on some of the military stuff than I am. My understanding is that a lot of those incidents are not like Benjamin Net yet not Netanyahu personally ordering the IDF to fire on an aid convoy. What we have here are examples, which you will inevitably get in war, of a commander of some kind making an, an incorrect call to to you know fire on someone they shouldn't have fired on, leading to um, humanitarian and disastrous, catastrophic consequences. Or you'll have an individual soldier doing something abhorrent. Yeah, absolutely. Again, that does happen in war. It happens in war, and and I think that it's perfectly ap appropriate for an organization like the ICC to prosecute those. Um, however, to you know, to expand those claims out to the senior levels of the Israeli government and to try and draw an equivalence with Hamas, I think that is kind of ridiculous. I, I don't. I don't think that's. A, I think that that is indicative of a court that's taken a very activist bent. Um, and I say that as someone who, of course, isn't privy to every single bit of evidence that the ICC might have. So I'm going to reserve my judgment on that. But, you know, whatever decisions Israel's made, and we can talk about whether or not they're proportionate or appropriate. We can talk about specific incidents that may meet the standard of a war crime. We can talk about all that kind of stuff. And I think we could have a very intelligent conversation about all that stuff putting that on par with the terrorist organization that's using its own people as human meat shields. I don't think there's an equivalency there. And I think that trying to treat these two things as equivalent is inherently problematic. Um, and I think that that is basically the position of Joe Biden. Joe Biden said this in a quote and said, look, we're not going to be abiding by these arrest warrants because this equivalency is, is, insane. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu basically s claimed that the that the arrest warrants were anti-Semitic on par with the Dreyfus affair. I, you know, again, that's his position. Baby's gonna baby. Baby's gonna baby. Uh, but anyway, what matters here for, from the perspective of the Canadian pol um, podcast is both Trudeau and Julie were asked, okay, if Netanyahu or Gallant come to Canada, are you going to arrest them? You know, we've signed on to the, the dictates of the International Criminal Court. They've issued an arrest warrant. Are we going to follow through on that? And Julie came forward and said something to the effect of, well, you know what? We were one of the founding countries to the ICC. Um, we have international obligations and we would follow through on those obligations. A couple points there. The first one I think you and you're going to want to get into, and then I'm going to want to follow up with it on a diplomatic note, is that's not a totally indefensible position to say, look, we actually believe in the international rules-based order, and if the, the organizations that we signed on to um, have credible evidence that they've that there's a, a, an arrest warrant warranted, we're going to meet our obligations. I don't think that's totally unreasonable, except. Matt, I'm setting you up here. 
I believe in the international rules-based order in the same way that I believe in the sanctity of marriage. And I'm not confessing anything that my wife would have to be upset about because I've behaved myself. But I have observed others perhaps not living entirely in line with their marital vows. There are certain concepts that we speak about as absolutes. And, and it, it, they're good. And then you look at the reality of human conduct and behavior, and one cannot help but be struck by the difference between the ideal and the reality. I would love, I would, I would hit my knees in prayers of thanks if I had any confidence that I did live in a rules-based international order. I don't. And if I did, that would be great because my kids could grow up in that world and we'd be heading boldly to that Star Trek future that I continue to cling to the faintest hope is just around the corner. But I don't think there is an international rules-based order. I think that's something countries like Canada talk about because we would rather talk about that than the fact that we need to be arming up so that we can defend ourselves in a world where the order is might makes right. And I don't disagree with you, Jen, and I don't even disagree with the minister. Um, I, you know, and the prime minister also, he gave, when he was asked about this, we, we talked already about the GST and the, the rebate check announcement. At that announcement, we had the chips and the bread behind him. He was asked about this. And he gave kind of a word salady answer, like yeah. he, he ragged the puck a little bit. The the ultimate meaning of it was that yes, Canada would honor the arrest warrants, which is why I joked earlier that like An Anthony House father is going to be really pissed off the day he finds himself slapping the uh, the uh, the handcuffs on Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, Anthony, get out, buddy! What are you doing? Um, okay, that's an aside. If the Prime Minister and Melanie Jolie believe in a rules-based international order and feel morally and legally compelled to arrest, to send poor Anthony off to arrest BB if he pops into Montreal for a fundraiser, okay. I am morally comfortable at a point where I'm like, no, we should be deciding our foreign policy in line with our own rational strategic interests, not with kind of weird ICC rulings. I'll be honest, I am satisfied, just based on my own observations, that individual members of the Israel Defense Forces have committed war crimes and should be punished either by Israeli military justice or, if necessary, the international community. I am, I am reasonably open-minded to the fact that Israel's rules of engagement, at the very least, I'm saying this very neutrally. I know people are passionate about this on both sides. I'm going to say this very neutrally. There's always a gray area in war. And I am open-minded to the fact that reasonable people could be convinced by the Israeli arguments that they are conforming as closely as possible with the, the, the laws of armed conflict. And I'm equally convinced people could be reasonably swayed to the opposite. So I get it. And there may well be things that Netanyahu is authorized that fall outside the, the rules of war. But these are the kinds of things that we only talk about when you aren't in a fight for your life. And I am absolutely convinced that if the survival of the Canadian state depended on it, we would do what we did in the Second World War. We'd firebomb as many civilian targets as we needed to win. And it is such an incredible first world luxury to exist in a world where having to do the unthinkable to survive exists on such an academic level that you could ever trick yourself into thinking the existence of the ICC rids us of the possible future necessity of firebombing some future Dresden. This is one of those things where I'm a pretty, you know me, Jen, I'm pretty relaxed. I'm pretty moderate in my personal inclinations. This is one of the biggest gulfs between me and the rest of the normies out there. I don't know how to explain to people this stuff. And I see Melanie Jolie and Justin Trudeau talking about this and I'm thinking, okay, I think they're going to be really disappointed with the trajectory of world history for the next 20 or 30 years at least. And I would feel better for my country 
if I thought our leaders were realistic about the world we are in and will be heading ever further into. And I know that's kind of a dark monologue, but I don't think international law law will save us. Yeah, I, I, here's just the thing that I would just point out. And again, we're trying to be very sort of balanced and neutral on the issue because we realize that passions are strong on both sides as ever. Um, I'm a big believer in institutions. I think institutions are the only bulwark that we have against our against the, the the worst aspects of our nature. The ICC is a good idea, but for it to function as an institution, all parties need to maintain faith in its neutrality and its fairness. And when you have parties lose faith in the ICC's neutrality and fairness and its ability to to uh, issue rulings in a way that is in dispassionate and impartial, then that institution loses its credibility. I think the ICC has lost enough people in the West, lost enough faith of, of enough people in the West that at this point, the idea that it can unilaterally issue decisions that are just going to be taken at face value by most Western countries is not realistic. Um, I don't think that the ICC is, has has the credibility that it needs among enough people in America or Europe or Canada, frankly, to have to be able to issue arrest warrants and be, have those be totally taken without a grain of salt. Is it is it a neutral organization or is it an activist organization? Is it a place for countries who are pissed off at Israel to score to score? points right i think one of the really interesting things and this is not a, a direct comment on the icc but one of the the things that some scholars and and uh, israeli historians have noted that israel is the jew among nations it is always isolated and, and hated and you look at something like a united nations human rights body where yeah. They're generating dozens and dozens and dozens of anti-Israel resolutions every year without noticing the rape militias rampaging through the Sudan or what Turkey's doing to the, the Kurds and and what's happening. Like I, on an on-the-line podcast I did where I, with a Canadian um, human rights and uh, humanitarian relief expert where we talked about what's happening to the Rohingya in Myanmar. And uh, you, you look at the total sum of human depravity and misery that exists in this world today. And you try to come up in, with your mind as a reasonable observer of what an appropriate distribution of human rights sanctions and memos from these international fora would look like. And you try to imagine what slice of that pie should be Israel. And even me, a pretty staunch Israel supporter, I don't say it should be zero, but it shouldn't be 100% of the pie or yeah. in the high 90s. And I'm just thinking, I believe in institutions too, Jen, but I think the problem is one of the things with the ICC and, and other instruments of, of international law like that is that they are an extra layer on top of existing institutions such as multilateral alliances and frankly, the nation state. And when we, we have never really, and I, I don't know if this is a lack of will or a l lack of possibility, we have never really empowered something like the ICC. Like the ICC does not have a fleet of ballistic missile submarines and tank divisions. Nor does, I mean, the same problem with the, US, with the UN exists, right? I mean, they're, they're, it's one thing to, to have a meeting place or have a place for soft power and there's a function for that, but without hard power, it's, it's, it's toothless. Um, I mean, my position on institutions is, yes, they matter, but institutions that fundamentally forget why they exist sign their own death warrant. You and I have seen this play out at a local level. We've seen it play out at a national level. We've seen it play, we're seeing it play out at an international level. If, if, if you can't be trusted by all parties to act in a fair-minded manner, you collapse because your institutional credibility collapses. And if you have no institutional credibility, you have no institution. Again, you and I could make some some pointed remarks about places where we've seen that happen in the last 
few years, even here in Canada, right? You know, you, the institutions have have to understand why they exist and why they serve and what what role they serve in an ecosystem. And if they yeah. are taken over by people who want to grandstand on their credibility and gra- use the platforms that they present in order to skew those institutions away from their original mandates and toward a different vision of what that should be, the institutions don't have the effect of successfully moving society and moving the needle. They just commit suicide. It's it's institutional suicide when that happens. Yeah. You know, I re- wrote a column not long ago, Jen, where I tried as, again, as, as neutrally and as intellectually as I could to try to explain what I think Israel is doing. And I wasn't trying to justify it or rationalize it. I was just trying to explain my analysis of it. And a really easy way of summarizing it is that the Israelis had given up on the institutions. And up until October 7th, yeah, right. they, they still had some remaining hope that they, with through like logical argument and moral appeals and lobbying and influence, that they would be yeah. able to win by about mid-morning of October 8th. The, the Israelis were like, fuck it. These other international fora are not going to keep us safe. The Israel Defense Force will. Yep. And what I think, no moral judgment, I think as of November 5th in the United States, we're all on that trajectory now. Yeah. I think that's sadly, sadly, I think that's true. And... The Israelis, because of their specific defensive circumstances and, and the circumstances of, of October 7th, were put into a position where they had to get there faster. But I think the United States is now, now obviously not exact circumstances, but I think the U.S. is not going to be constrained by existing international agreements. The Americans are going to assert American interest. And they always have. Uh, you know what? Up until fairly recently, they still given lip service to this stuff, right? Like the ICC, the UN, this stuff only functions to the extent that it does with a degree of American say so. You think Trump's going to get what the Security Council says? Not remotely. I mean, look. I mean, this is uh, this is this is all very depressing because I mean, you and I are big institutional people. We we believe in institutions and the and the value that they have on on human nature. But I think that we have seen in the last several decades that the multilateral institutions, the, the supranational institutions, don't fun- they just don't function. They don't work. Um, that's unfortunate because it's going to lead to a worse society for you, me, and our children as a result of that coming to that realization. Um, and that's not to give Israel pass, and that's not to say that, as I said, we've been very clear. It's like there, there are some things that Israel does that has done that absolutely warrants censure and investigation. We're, we're, we would acknowledge that. Um, but anyway, the, the point that I actually just wanted to end this off with is is bringing, again, coming back to, as I know as, as much as everybody is really, really on their edges of their seats, desperate for our analysis of the state of the ICC, um, important as we are, uh, I just want to bring it back to the Canadian side of this, because I think yeah, what's the crucial The line for, has spoken. Well, yeah, the line hath spoken. This is where it is. Go with God. Um, what's re- What's actually very important to note about this is more that Melanie usually is giving these statements about, you know, believing in the ICC and we'll follow through on our obligations. What about our international obligations to NATO? Well, that's exactly it. Well, like, wh- how come we get to pick and choose our, our military spending when it serves us, but this obligation is going to be taken as ironclad? Like, the, the, like the fantasy that we, that we follow through on our international obligations every time because we're just Canadian, that's what Canadians do— is is pro forma nonsense. It's so it's like abject bullshit and verifiably untrue. Verifiably objectively bullshit. Secondly, you know, so she's coming up there and she's talking about this is what Canadians do and we blah 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 blah. Like moments later, America comes out and says, "Yeah, these ICC warrants are bullshit. We're not gonna we're not gonna abide by them." Which means that we we we're we're putting ourselves at odds with our major ally on a geopolitical issue. So there goes friend shoring. There goes you know real politique right there. Like on the like while you're literally in D.C. collapsing as we speak. While you're in D.C. in order to build bridges with the Trump people. Oh, okay. I, moving on. 
I couldn't trust him for the ad there. You know what? I was thinking a little bit, Jen, and kind of like, we'll wrap it up after this, because this ended up being a, we thought this would be a quick 10-minute gab, and it's been almost 40 minutes. Um, we hope you enjoyed it, everybody. Um, I was thinking about things like the ICC, the International Criminal Court of Justice, the United Nations, for other multilateral fora. Even you can say, like, it's a little bit of a stretch, but I'm pulling in things like... Uh, pollution summits or the COP conferences for climate change, right? Imagine, Jen, you lived in a garden community where all the residents were like upper middle class retirees. And you had to design from scratch the police force to provide necessary policing services for that community. And then imagine that you were given the same task for a drug-infested, cartel-blighted inner-city ghetto. A complete urban slum of which exists all over the world. The kind of police forces you would end up designing from theoretical scratch would look different. And I think things like the ICC, the ICJ, the United Nations, and again, a little further afield, other multilateral environmental and economic fora were designed for a world where we knew it wasn't quite the upper middle class garden retirement community, but we believe the world was trending in that direction when it may actually have been trending more towards the ghetto. And since our international fora are designed to break up fights at the croquet pitch, or basically to be the enforcement arm of the condo association, if we send them in to bust up the cartel gang battle over the local brothel full of trafficked victims, they're going to get killed. Or to put it a little more benignly, they will not be fully effective in the intended role. What do you send in to stop the gangs who are fighting over the trafficking brothel? You send in the tactical guys in the armored vehicles who wear masks so their families don't get killed. That's the way the world is trending. Melanie Jolie is like, well, you know, we've heard there's problems, so let's get a couple of our garden community retirement villa cops on their golf cart and we'll send them to the cartel battleground. So I believe in institutions too, but you have to use the one that's fit for purpose. Our international fora are not fit for purpose in a world that has in the last five years seen a return of kinetic great power military conflict, including the Ukrainians using a nuclear capable missile with multiple reentry vehicles on a Ukrainian city this week. Pardon me, the Russians using it against Ukraine. Melanie Jolie got nothing to say about that. Canada has nothing to convene about that. The Americans, with a strategic nuclear deterrent and limited high-altitude ballistic missile defenses, they can intervene on that. So when certain institutions fail or are no longer fit for purpose, we pivot to the other ones. The ICC, the ICJ, the UN, they're not fit for purpose. What might be is NATO, AUKUS, Five Eyes, arrangements like this that are designed to deal with the world as it is or is becoming, not the world as we hoped it might be. I'm not convinced those institutions are ready. I'm, in fact, I would go so far as to say I'm pretty convinced they're not, but at least they're the right kind of institutions. I think that's a very elegant way to end our podcast, or now, again, overlong podcast. We were trying to be efficient. We failed, I'm sorry. We are not fit for purpose. Um, but on that note, do like and subscribe to the line. Do check us out. Um, our written dispatches are lots of fun as well. Uh, and join us in our online community. If you page are a paid subscriber to the line, you can contribute to our comments section, which Matt and I usually do read and have sometimes have fun weighing in on. So uh, do check us out. That's again, www.readtheline.ca. And we hope to see you again next week. Our comment section somewhere between the retirement garden villa and the cartel-infested slums, but yes. 
Thanks, everybody. Shout out to Halifax. I'll see some of you shortly. Take good care, guys. Have a great weekend. Today's podcast was brought to you by Unsmoke Canada. Now is the time to modernize Canadian laws so that adult smokers have information and access to better alternatives. By doing so, we can create lasting change. Learn more at unsmoke.ca.